Hello there, and welcome back to 60 Years of the Space Age, an ongoing internet podcast series where we tell the story of the human presence in outer space from Sputnik to the current day, in commemoration of the launch of Sputnik 60 years ago in 1957. I've got a very special program ahead for y'all today as we enter episode 5 of the retelling of humanity's journey to the stars. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. You are now tuned in to Science Epics 60 Years of the Space Age. For the past few episodes up until now, we've spent time pretty much setting up the stage for our two vital characters at this point. The two men that you could say really defined the beginning of the space age, or should I say the launch of the space age, and those are Russian chief designer Sergei Korolev and German rocket scientist and space architect Werner von Braun. We talked about who they were, their upbringings, and their adventures, or you could say misadventures, during the Second World War. Would make for a good animated series, wouldn't you say? <laughs> they lived as the legends of their time following the Second World War. Both men, Sergei Korolev and Werner von Braun, emerged from the challenges and hardships of the war to become the undisputed kings of the rocket kingdoms and the primary drivers of rocket technology for their respective countries that emerged from World War II to become the undeniable superpowers of the globe, the United States of America and the Soviet Union. Werner von Braun was a former Nazi scientist, having been voluntarily captured by the Americans. He began to work for America and would become instrumental in their efforts in pursuing the space frontier. And Sergei Korolev was a former Siberian Gulag prisoner, since pardoned and given a prestigious position as chief designer in the space program of the Soviet Union. He would become a force of nature, driving the Soviets to many a remarkable success in outer space during the early stages of the space age. The countries of which these two men belonged to couldn't have been any more different ideologically from each other. In the new age following the Second World War, the Soviet Union was a communist dictatorship which put the needs of the state above personal human rights. And the United States was a capitalist democracy that, in theory, preferred to value the personal freedom and liberty of the individual above all else, in theory. Both ideologies thought that they were the way forward for humanity, socially, politically, and economically. Both ideologies thought that the other system would be ineffective at guiding the human race to its true potential, and a new golden age for mankind on Earth and in outer space. This disagreement caused America and the Soviet Union to compete in the greatest geopolitical dick measuring contest of the 20th century, the Cold War, that stretched out over a large part of the 20th century and would see various parts of the world split between the two ideologies. Sometimes the war would even get a little hot and at other times a little too hot. We're just glad that it's over and we're definitely smiling because it didn't end in a full-out nuclear confrontation. The incentive of the Cold War would eventually spill over into the space age and would give rise to what we now call the space race, a competition that would set both Cold War superpowers towards the endeavor of exploring space and reaching out higher, farther, and in many ways faster than humanity has ever gone before. The space race would literally fuel the rockets that would get the first humans into space and allow the first human being to set foot on the moon. So for many an episode following this one, our story of the space age will take place within the context of the space race between the United States and the Soviet Union. 
Now, the space race would find the two kings of the rocket kingdoms, Sergei Korolev and Werner von Braun, leading engineering design teams and going head-to-head -head in an epic struggle, binding together technology and the human spirit that would eventually culminate in some of the defining moments of the 20th century. As we progress on our journey through the years here on 60 years of the space age, we begin to approach the more climactic moments of the story. And this episode is no different. We're talking about the culmination of persons, places, and things that would get their own entries into the news headlines as well as the history books. As we enter into the space age at the beginning of the Cold War, we start to encounter the first of the great monuments of the space age. The R-7 rockets. The R-7 rockets, designed by Sergei Korolev and based on Von Braun's V-2 design, would be the instrument that would carry Sputnik and Yuri Gagarin from their launch pads in Baikonur, Kazakhstan, straight into the annals of human history. In the decade following the Second World War in the 1950s, as old man Stalin was breathing his last, Korolev had become the king of his own industrial empire in Kaliningrad, formerly Konigsberg of German East Prussia, northeast of the Russian capital of Moscow. Korolev operated from a secret laboratory called Special Design Bureau 1, or in Russian, Opnoye Konstruktorskoye Bureau Adin, OKB1, a secret and discreet research facility that conducted cutting-edge research on advanced technology, usually for military applications. No surprise there. A lot of the things the Soviets did back then were kept in secret. We only know about them now after the fact because of how things were run in the former Soviet Union. As we will discover later on in this story, the Soviets would keep a great many things shrouded in secrecy and would only reveal them to the world after they had provided a boost to or would no longer harm the propaganda narrative of the Soviet state. Work on the R-7 rockets was no exception. That's just how things were run back then. Korolev's OKB-1 was one of many design bureaus set up by the Russians to conduct research on rockets and spaceflight technology. The reason was, remember, to develop some sort of technological leg up or advantage over their western counterparts. Now, I refrain from saying enemies because the two great nation states were not technically at war, but as Sun Tzu put it, in peace, prepare for war. And that's exactly what got the ball rolling on the space program those days. And it was out of this special design bureau, OKB-1, that the R-7 rocket design would be born. The rocket stood at over 30 meters tall, comprising of a single core rocket, with four detachable booster engines that fall apart mid-flight, something that had never been seen before, the multi-stage rocket. The West called it the Sapwood. Its Russian creators called it the Semyorka, or Little Seven, and it was truly a remarkably versatile and powerful design. The littlest of the seven, the Semyorka, would carry the Sputnik satellite the first man-made object in space, streaking across the October sky within months of its initial debut. The eyes of the world would be upon it. Yeah. Easy. Remember Valentin Glushko, the guy that had purportedly landed Korolev in the Gulag all those years ago? Well, he got his own OKB Special Design Bureau that made the engines for Korolev's rockets. The two scientists still beefed with each other with a passion, no doubt, and even I would hold a grudge against any man that would wrongfully land me in prison for a certain number of years. But Korolev was still largely in charge, though. 
He was a strong-willed, purposeful person who knew exactly what he wanted. He would shout and swear at you, but he would never insult you. Everyone who worked under him loved the chief designer. As passionate as Korolev was towards his goal of inventing the first ever vehicle capable of spaceflight, he still had his share of challenges that arose from the Soviet army management and the politics that came with it. The cutting-edge design bureaus all deferred to the Kremlin and the Ministry of Defense. People who were far more concerned of the propaganda effect and the show of strength of the motherland projected by Korolev's rockets rather than the actual working principles and significance of the rockets themselves. So you could imagine a herd of wild-eyed sheep being led through a new gate as Korolev gave them a tour of his rockets and his facilities. The Soviet leaders, powerful men like Nikita Khrushchev, could scarcely believe in this scale of the machinery and engineering set up to enable the R-7 to fly. The R-7 rockets that Korolev and his team would invent would eventually find use as both a missile and an orbital payload carrier, as a, as a vehicle to deliver things into space. This suited the Soviet generals just fine, apparently. So long as the rockets could carry nuclear warheads to America, Korolev was allowed to do whatever was necessary. It was just that all his research had to follow on the back of the military. So all of his spaceships and cosmonauts were launched on the same missiles that could, if the need arose, also carry nuclear bombs halfway across the world. But the R-7 as the first intercontinental ballistic missile capable of such range. It was more than just a rocket. It was also the engine inside, the guidance system, and the trajectory calculations involved. It was a group effort, no doubt, involving many other Soviet scientists. But Korolev was the man to coordinate it all. And it took a man like Korolev, having gone through his ordeal in Kolyma, to make it all run. There was this one time a very high-ranking Soviet army Tovarish commander refused access to an important radio link during a test flight, and Korolev wasted no time in calling him out, shouting, shouting straight up to the man, You do not know how to do your job! Give me the link or I will have you demoted to sergeant! He probably shouted in Russian and probably made it sound cooler than I did, but you get the idea. A brave move, thinking about how easily you could get punished for disobedience in the former Soviet Union. It took a man like Korolev to pave the road to the R-7. Today, the R-7 takes its shape in the form of the Soyuz launcher, and it's seen continued use with many changes throughout the years, but it's still the same core design. I imagine that if Korolev were alive today, he could see the Soyuz being led up to the gantry ready for launch and a smile would light up his face. It's still fundamentally the same four liquid fueled booster engines attached to a central core that functions as the second stage design that came out of OKB-1 and flew on its maiden voyage in August of 1957. If you want a detailing of how core rocket boosters work, I do have a FameLab video in my playlist talking about the Ariane 6, the European Space Agency's cutting-edge rocket of our time. But as cutting-edge as the Ariane 6 is, it can't hold a candle, or should I say, can't hold a thruster to the legacy of the R-7 that has been launched more times than any large rocket to date. Fundamentally, the way we get to space has not changed over the last 60 years. You still have to overcome the force of gravity holding you down to the Earth, or any other planet for that matter. You still have to achieve escape velocity, and after all of that, you still have to make sure your vehicle does not explode on your way up. What Korolev and the R-7 rockets did for that challenge was to provide a workhorse, an old reliable that could do the job more than most of the time. The risks still exist, as with anything worth doing, and with the space age and space race ramping up in stakes, Korolev would find his R-7 to be flying at the right time and the right place. This has been Son of Terra 92, with 60 years of the space age, here on Science Epic. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.